God. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 2, everybody. The book of Ruth, chapter number 2. <clears throat> and when you find the book of Ruth, chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 down through to about verse 9. Ruth, chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. The Bible says over here, And Naomi had a kinsman of her, of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn, after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, and she, that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, and neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, and the opportunity we have to be in your house here tonight. Thank you for your kindness and mercy towards us. And we pray now, Lord, that you would bless the message and speak to every one of us individually as you see fit. For thou knowest all the hearts and minds in here tonight. We ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in this chapter, we're really going to see how Ruth is a type of the church. We saw in chapter 1 that God visited his people in giving them bread. And so Naomi rose up and decided to return to her people, and Ruth followed her, seeking her God. Orpah was only seeking what she can get from Naomi, and when she saw that Naomi can give her nothing, she turned around and went back to Moab. Ruth, however, was not looking to Naomi, but to God. And you see that because you know in Ruth chapter 1, Ruth says these words over here in verse number 16. Ruth 1, 16. It says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Ruth was not just following Naomi. She was following the God of Naomi. That's what she was pursuing. Not just a person, not just people, but to the God of Israel. And, and that is why she continued with her and didn't turn around and go back to Moab. And, and the same is true for all of us. If we look to people... We will eventually get disappointed and turn back to the world. You know, I'm, I'm serious. Like I've, I've seen it myself in my life as a Christian that the, all Christians, no matter how good and spiritual, no matter how long they've been in church, they struggle with their flesh. They have their weaknesses. They sooner or later, you're going to see flaws and disappointments in every single one of them. It doesn't matter if they're preachers and theologians and graduates of Bible school. It doesn't matter how many souls they've won to the Lord or what they're doing for God. If your eyes are on the people and on the person and on the preachers and on the pastors, sooner or later, you're going to get, get discouraged and quit. But if you do like what the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, then we will continue to serve Him because the Lord Jesus Christ never fails. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we need to understand here tonight that none of us are here tonight simply because of somebody else. If you're here tonight because somebody else is here and you want to be next to that person or with that person, then you're not going to last very long. We should not be here because of somebody else. We should be here tonight because of Him. Even if that person who's closest to you could be a family member, could be a friend, were to stop coming or not be here anymore, you ought to still come not because of that person, but because the Lord is here and we want to be where God is. Would you not agree with me on that? tonight? Paul said in one place, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. He didn't say he was the prisoner of Rome. He wasn't looking at Rome. He wasn't looking at the government. He wasn't looking at the people. His eyes were on the Lord. He said, it's the, if it's the will of God for my life to be a prisoner for Him, then so be it. I'm the prisoner of the Lord. And only when we see things in that way are we truly going to have the victory 
over this world. Ruth decided to follow God and not to follow Orpah, not to follow Naomi, not to follow the people, but to follow the God of Israel. And to follow God came with, first of all, I need you to see this, first of all, it came with a cost. It came with a cost. Notice that she paid a price. You know, it says over there in, uh, in, in verse number 11 of, uh, of chapter 2, it says, And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Notice there that she left everything. She, put, she paid a price to follow the God of Israel. Nor does the Bible indicate that Ruth was running away from some kind of hard time in Moab. Nor does the Bible indicate that there was poverty there or persecution and she was fleeing those things to follow God, to go to Israel. To the contrary, it seems from what we read over here that Moab was a place where the economy was booming, everything was doing well, her health was fine, her family was there, her culture was there, her friends were there, her language was there, and she gave it all up to follow God. You know, the Bible said, Jesus Christ said, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to uh, forsake all that you have. Even family and friends and mother and father. If you want to truly be the, uh, the Lord's disciple, you're going to have to forsake all that you have. And there was a multitude following the Lord Jesus Christ when he turned around and looked at that multitude. And he didn't look at them and say, congratulations that you're all following me. And I want to have all this great number here. He just looked at them and said, hey, if you truly want to be my disciple, you're going to have to forsake all that you have. And he said, if you, if you do not forsake all that you have, then he said, you cannot be my disciple. I've asked this question before many times in preaching, but what is the highest price you ever paid for the Lord? You know, we need to get back to preaching that again because North Americans, they don't view Christianity in that way anymore. Nowadays, we see it as a way to get more from God or have more in this world. We see it as, as a means to an end. But my friend, God is not a means to an end. God is the end. He is the reason why we do what we do. He is not a means to an end. He is the end. If you go into the average Christian bookstore nowadays, you'll see a lot of Christian books that will tell you how to get more from God. How to, you know, the seven keys to success and all this stuff and how to get more and how to, uh, you know, have the power of God on you and everything else. But, uh, you know, I I'm telling you, my friend, tonight that God has already done a lot for me. It's me that has to do more for Him, not Him that has to do more for me. The real question is, my friend, here tonight, what have we given? What have we sacrificed? What have we left behind? Following God comes with a price. It comes with a cost. Number two, it comes with a cause. Look at Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. You're going to have to forgive me tonight. I'm a little weak. I got a bad headache. Pray for me. I just had my Tim Hortons. First one of the day. It's starting to kick in. Amen. It'll cure me pretty soon. Hopefully throughout the course of the message. But notice over here in verse 1 and 2, it says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her, of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. You know, like we saw last week, God visited His people in giving them bread. But when they went back to that land, it was not just for them to get fattened up on the bread. They went back to the land, and right away Ruth went to work. And you know, when, when you follow the Lord, you follow the Lord. There, there's not only a cost, but there's also a cause. There's a reason. And she began to work in the field. And this is what we're talking about tonight. This is our topic. It's Ruth working in the field. This is a beautiful picture of missionary work. Ruth, a type of the church, doing missionary work, gleaning and working in the field. And speaking about missionary work, the Lord many times refers to it as the harvest or the field. He said, the harvest truly is plenteous. And he said, the laborers are few. He said, pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he will what? Send forth laborers into the harvest. It ought to be our desire here tonight to see more people go out into the harvest and go out into the work. You know, there, there's a, I told you about him last week, Andrew Murray. He was a, a missionary there to South Africa. And Andrew Murray, you know, his heart was to win all of Africa to the Lord. They started a school down there in South Africa, sent missionaries all over Africa, starting churches everywhere, uh, getting people, I mean, Nigeria, Malawi, all these different places that came out of that, uh, that, out of that place in, in South Africa. And that preacher, Andrew Murray, after 37 years of prayer for revival, God began to work and they began to be blessed and the churches began to grow and the churches began to prosper. But they understood something that when God begins to bless their churches, it's not 
not just for us to enjoy a great big work and have a lot of money and build a big, you know, whatever building and so that it can be a great big work that we've built. He understood that when God begins to bring His blessings in, it's so that we can send workers out. God blesses us so that we can send workers out into the field of service. And you know, there was a time when they, they invited him. Dwight L. Moody invited Andrew Murray to a conference over there in the United States uh, about missions. And they had all these great preachers there preaching on missions. And Andrew Murray could not go to the conference. But what he did was he had all the messages that were preached at the conference sent to him. I guess they had very good stenographers in those days. And they sent all the services that were preached at that missionary conference sent to Andrew Murray. And he read them all. And he read all those things, and throughout the whole time, he noticed that they were always talking about something called the missionary problem. The missionary problem. And so he wrote a book called The Key to the Missionary Problem. And I wanted to find that book, and I began to read it. I found it online, began to read it. And then I found, an, uh, and he wrote another book called The State of the Church. And basically what he says in that book, The State of the Church, he said basically that because of the state of what it's in, the church, because of the state that it's in, is actually unequal to the task of, of fulfilling the Great Commission. And you know, we often hear about places in this world that have no church. You know, there's many towns here in Canada that have no church. No, I mean, yes, they may have a Catholic church or something like that. But I'm talking about a true Bible-preaching, fire-breathing, window-rattling, Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing church. They're few and far between here in our country. There's not many of them. There's not many towns that have good churches in them. And you know what that tells us? That tells us that the body of Christ as a whole, I believe, has failed at the task of fulfilling the Great Commission. The Lord told us before He left this world, He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our marching orders. That's our calling of, as Christians. And, and you know, He wants us to take the gospel into the uttermost parts of the world. He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To every creature. You say, What about those Muslims? He said, Every creature. You say, What about those Greek Orthodox? He said, Every creature. I mean, that's his orders to the church to go and send the gospel out and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our calling. That's our cause. That's our purpose. And it's more important than the Super Bowl. Oh, you know, this morning, some people tell me, all right, you know, I'm going to this to watch the Super Bowl. Who cares about the Super Bowl? In about three years from now, nobody's going to know who won it anyway. I'm not going to watch a bunch of people who, stand, who refuse to stand for the anthem. Are we all right tonight? Get up there and, and, and play and, and make millions of dollars, you know, to run a ball down the field and everything. And, and I'm going to give up my Sunday night service at church to go watch the Super Bowl. You understand? I think Andrew Murray was right when he said the state of the church, because of the state of the church, that's why it's unequal to the task of fulfilling the Great Commission. You say, but pastor, they don't want to hear it. It's a waste of time. That's not the point. Jesus didn't say, go out there if they want to hear it. He said, go preach it to them. And we have been guilty, my friend. We have been guilty of, of sitting and enjoying the blessings of God, but forgetting that God blesses us to use us for His cause and not to just kind of sit around and, and enjoy the, uh, the, the fullness of the bread and enjoy all the blessings of God, uh, uh, but to actually use that to be a blessing and to send the gospel out to the rest of this world. We have failed. Why have we failed? Andrew Murray says a few things in that book that I thought were interesting, but I'm going to give you some of my own thoughts here tonight that I see here in this chapter. First of all, I think that the pastors have failed to rouse the people. You know, I, if, if we're really going to put the blame somewhere, I'm going to have to put it, you know, I mean, I'm going to have to look in the mirror and, and take responsibility that I'm part of the problem. That, that really, I mean, if there's a failure of the body of Christ to fulfill the, the Great Commission, and I'm part of the body of Christ, then I must be part of the problem. And, and the first thing we need to do, and the first thing I need to understand, is that really the failure has been, first of all, with the pastors. And that's what Andrew Murray said. The first failure of all is the pastors have failed to rouse the people. You know, you know honestly, I get tired of hearing pastors get up and whine about being in the ministry. Talking about oh how hard it is and how we have to do this and this is so hard and this is so terrible and, and poor me and woe is me that I'm that I'm called into the ministry. I don't feel that way tonight. Amen. You know, Paul the Apostle, man, he endured a lot worse than most of us do, and he didn't talk that way. 
You know, he said, what shall, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness? He said, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I mean, despite all these things working against us, he said, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That should be our attitude tonight. A few weeks ago, I preached a sermon on a Wednesday night called, you know, I speak as a fool. And yes, you know, just going through the various trials that we've had as Christians, as, as preachers and being in the ministry. And, you know, Paul did say that one time in one chapter. He said, I speak as a fool. And, you know, he, he began to list all his trials and everything. But you know what? Yes, it's been hard. Yes, I understand that it's been a little bit difficult. But you know what? Through it all, God's been good. And honestly, it really hasn't been that bad. It really hasn't been that bad. I have no reason to mully grub tonight. I have no sob story to tell tonight. I have no reason to feel sorry for myself. God has been good. And if you're a young man here tonight, contemplating the call of God, let me tell you, don't avoid it. Get in on it. Get in on it. Work in the field. You know, you think about Philip in the book of Acts, chapter 8. Stephen got stoned by, by the people. He, he preached one sermon, got stoned to death. And in the next chapter, Philip gets up and starts preaching. Just because Stephen got stoned, that didn't discourage Philip from getting in on it. Same thing with William Nibb, who was a missionary over there to Jamaica. His brother died just a little bit earlier, but he went out into the work even after his brother died. I mean, it didn't discourage him from getting into the work just because somebody before him had some terrible trials. They didn't have uh, an attitude that said, I don't want to do it. They didn't have an attitude that said, you know, it's like I heard about, uh, you know, uh, my, my sister-in-law, her, her grandfather. You know, he, got, he enlisted in the Second World War. Both her grandfathers were in the Second World War fighting for Canada. And, and his eyes were real bad. And in those days, you know, they'd bring you over there to the doctor's office and, and they'd put the eye chart in front of you and yet they'd say, all right, what letter is that? E, what letter is that? F, J, whatever. You know, you'd have the eye chart and that's how they, that's how they check your eyes to make sure they're okay before they let you get in and enlist in the, in the army to, be, to go fight. And, and he knew that his eyes were so bad that he would not be able to pass that test of the eye chart. So you know what he did? He memorized it. He memorized it. And so when he got called into the eye doctors and he wanted to go into the military so he can fight for his country and willing to lay down his life for his country, they said, all right, there's the eye chart. What are the letters? He couldn't see anything, but he had them all memorized. He said, me, Jay, whatever. You know, he had the whole thing memorized and that's how he got into the military and fought for his country, came back to Canada and then started about 10 churches in Canada. It's a man living for a cause. For a cause outside himself. For a reason of existence beyond just me and my personal happiness. I'm telling you my friend tonight, there is a cause. These men didn't let anything discourage them. They had a sign me up for the job mentality. Use me, send me, I enlist, I volunteer. General Patton was able to rouse the troops before World War II. I read his book. You know, Brother Rick Sowell sent it to me several years ago on leadership. You know, you don't even have to read the book. Just look at the pictures of General Patton. Just look at pictures of him and you'll get fired up. All you got to do is look at a picture of the man and you'll get encouraged. All you got to do is look at some pictures of J. Frank Norris and you'll get fired up. All you got to do is look at some pictures of Lester Roloff and you'll get fired up. I mean, those men just had something that would just rouse the people. I was in a special service one time. There was a preacher there. He was an old man of God in the 70s. He served his country as a ranger in the Second World War. He came back to the United States, started churches. He was a great preacher. And they brought him up to the front. His name was Mel Sabaka. And he started that church there, First Baptist Church there on Staten Island. And when they brought him up to the front and he, he stood up there as an old man after about 175 treatments of uh, uh, radiation treatments of cancer and still going and still preaching for God. I mean, there was just something special about being in that service while he was there. And when I saw him walk up to the pulpit, I'm not saying that, that, that we should have our eyes focused on great men, but yet still there was something special about it that made me say, it put something in my heart that made me want to say, Lord, put me in on that. I want in on that life. It fired me up. It inspired me somehow. Send me, Lord. Nowadays, we have a bunch of soft, weak, discouraged, whiny guys talking about how they have it so hard, the roof leaks. The money's a little tight. Man, you want to talk about a leaky roof? I've, I, you, know, you want to talk about money being tight? Man, we've experienced all that. But God has been good. 
God has been good. Bring those kids, you know, to that, that uh, you know, uh, that the student convention there, and they got these guys get up there and try to preach and everything, and it's like, you couldn't get inspired. You couldn't get fired up by those guys who stand up there in their little running shoes and their untucked shirts and their clicky thingies, and they got the screen behind them and no Bible and nothing, talking about you and how you feel, soft-spoken, effeminate. They sound like women. I'm serious. Are we all right tonight? I'm talking about, my friend, we ought to be able to inspire somebody. We ought to be able to rouse the people. What a difference from men like Eon Paisley, who went into the Irish Parliament when Pope John Paul II was there and held up a sign that said, Pope John Paul II, Antichrist. And said, I reject you and renounce you as the Antichrist. Man, you know, when I see that, you know what it does to me? It, I say, Lord, put some of that in me. Put some of that. Give me a bit of that backbone. Man, that takes some guts. True success is not in a preacher that can build a big work, but I think it's a preacher who can produce missionaries. That can produce missionaries. Now, we have done very good at educating our people. We've turned everybody into expert theologians. But I think we have failed to rouse the people for the Great Commission. The pastors have failed to rouse the people. Secondly, I want to say this, the people have failed to see the field. Look at me in verse 9. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. Let thine eyes be on the field. In other words, look at the field. And the field in the parables, according to Matthew chapter 13, is the world. That's the field. That's, that's the work. And, and, and it's, it's God's world, and, and he, he set us on this world, and He set us over here, and sent us here, so that we can work in this field. And that's what our eyes should be on. Not on our jobs, and our economy, and how we can, you know, make a good life for us down here. And, and I'm not against any of those things, but really the cause and the reason why we're here, living our life, why God set my two feet on this earth, is to work on this field. And every one of us needs to be involved in it somehow. You know, recently I was, you know, you know, I talked to some of the men in our church and they tell me they're called into the work every once in a while. I say, where do you think you're called? And they'll tell me here, they'll tell me there. And, and you know, my heart is for Canada, really. My heart is for Canada. I want to see Canadians go out there and start churches in Canada. That's where my heart is. And you know, every once in a while I'll hear a person say, I'm called here, I'm called there, and they're, and they're not really called or feel a burden for the same thing that I feel a burden for. And for a while there, I was kind of feeling a little bit bad about it. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I mean, shouldn't we win our own people over here? And we, Lord, I mean, our, our country is, you know, is in need itself. And, 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 you know, kind of started to feel a little bit bad about it. Almost like, you know, feeling like a bit of a complaint in my heart towards the Lord. And then God spoke to my heart real directly about the man Jonah. And Jonah was upset with God because he wasn't called to his own people. But he got called to the enemies of his people. To the Ninevites. And Jonah went over there to the Ninevites. And the Lord said, and Jonah got upset over the fact that they were getting saved. And he sat outside the city waiting to see what will happen. He saw that no judgment fell. said, there you go, Lord. I knew you were going to save him. He was upset about it. And the Lord said to him, I forget now, it was like 200,000 of them. He said, you know, I mean, you're upset about a little gourd, but, but Jonah, there, I have 200,000 people or whatever the number was in the city of Nineveh that cannot discern between right hand and left. In other words, it doesn't matter what their race was on the outside. God is concerned about the soul. And you know, my friend, God has called us not to win ethnicities, but to win souls. And a soul is a soul, whether it's a Canadian soul, an American soul, a Bulgarian soul, a Greek soul, a, 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 a Turkish soul. And they have souls too. An Italian soul, or what you know, a Portuguese or Chinese soul. I mean, God doesn't see the outside layer that covers the soul. God sees the eternal soul inside, and God is concerned about those souls, no matter what they were, no matter what they are on the outside. I think sometimes we get caught up in trying to win our country and our people and our nation, and trying to turn it around and forget that God has not called us to win just ethnicities, but to win souls, no matter what they are on the outside. 
I'm telling you, my friend, tonight that our eyes need to be on the field. We have failed to see the field. I was a preacher one time. His name was Oswald Smith. He wanted to be a missionary. His heart was on the missionary field. He went all over the... Man, he went to the so Solomon Islands. He went to Africa. He went to Europe. He went to preaching to cannibals. He went to preaching everywhere. He could find somewhere to preach. And every time he'd go out, he'd fall sick and have to come back home. His body could not endure the pressures of the missionary field. He'd be traveling like 30 miles a day on, on, on a camel there in the desert. And, and, you know, he'd pass out, picked up malaria, got sent back home. And then finally what happened was he realized God didn't want him on the mission field. God wanted him to pastor a church and he took a little church that was in great debt. I mean, they were in terrible debt. And his first Sunday, walking up to the pulpit, one of the deacons said, said, Pastor, we've told you everything there is to know about this church except one thing. We are in terrible debt. And he got up that first Sunday and he preached on missions. Giving to missions. And then Sunday night he preached again on giving to missions. And he said to all the people, I want you to come back every night this week. And we're going to have a solid week of preaching every night. And they came back every night. And every night he preached on missions, missions, missions. To the point where that church caught that vision. And started giving to missions. They paid off their debt. They, 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 they were able to pay all their needs. And they got to the point, this was a church in Toronto, Canada. And he was more effective when he saw that he was, he was able to uh, go out there and, and teach people and, and teach people that every one of them needs to be involved in the Great Commission. They gave five times or six times more to missions than they did to their own needs. Their own needs, I mean, to cover their cost of the church was something like $39,000 a year. We're talking way, way back then. They gave two hundred and sixty dollars or $280,000 a year to missions. They gave out way more than what they had for themselves. He was more effective when he came home and preached missions than he ever would have been if he was to go alone. Now I'm telling you, my friend, here tonight, the most effective thing that we can do is to inspire others. Every one of us in here tonight should be a worker in the field. Every one of us in here tonight, I'm talking about men, women, and children. I'm talking about all the kids, too. I'm saying every one of us as part of the body of Christ is called to somehow take part in the Great Commission. Every single one of us should be working on trying to get somebody saved. Every single one of us ought to have missionaries on our prayer list. Every one of us ought to be giving somehow, tracking people, uh, giving out tracts, helping the supply. If God has not called you to go yourself, God has called you to give the money and supply the need for somebody else to go in your place. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. We don't work for ourselves. We work so we can have to give to Him that needeth. It's not all about you and me. God gives us money to help missionaries get the gospel out. And our problem is we take it, we spend it all on ourselves. We're all consumed with the things of this world. You know, I mean, scopes, man, for a guy. A scope is $5,000 for a scope. I mean, there was a guy man, at the shooting range. He had, a, he had a nice, beautiful, long rifle over there. You know, he said, uh, he said spent $20,000 on this. $20,000 on the scope and all the other things, whatever, to get this rifle the way. $20,000 on a, on a rifle to shoot a target. Now, listen, let me tell you something. You know, I mean, uh, if you were a, a millionaire and you could afford it, that's one thing. But on my salary... <laughs> And I'd venture to say on most of our salaries in here, that would be going a little bit overboard. I would rather invest my life in the work of the gospel. I'd rather invest my life in the work of getting people saved. I don't know about you, my friend, but I'd rather just invest my life in the work of God. You think about the early church. You know, I, I got to laugh at people when they say, you know, tithings for the Old Testament. You know what the early church did in the New Testament? Sold everything. Lands, houses, and gave it all. Hey, you want to be New Testament and not Old Testament? Why don't you sell it all? 
and give it all. That's what they did in the New Testament. Are we all right tonight? I'm telling you, my friend, tonight, that even if you were to do that, it would be a great... You know, I'm not telling you to do that, but if you did that, it would be a great investment in spiritual things. You'd, you'd be purchasing for yourself a great eternal investment. I heard one time about an atheist that questioned a Christian about heaven. He said to him, said, you know, you Christians, you believe in heaven. What are you going to do when you get to heaven anyway? And that Christian said, I'm going to go up to the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm going to thank him for saving my soul. And then the man said, all right, then what are you going to do? He said, then I'm going to go and find the missionary that preached the gospel to me. And I'm going to thank him for bringing the gospel to me. And the atheist said, all right, and then what are you going to do? He said, then I'm going to go find the person who gave the money to send the missionary to get the gospel to me. And I'm going to thank him for giving the money. And then the atheist left him alone. (laughs) I'm telling you, my friend, every single one of us is called to be a part of the Great Commission. Every single one of them, every single one of us, man, woman, and child, It's our individual duty. It's our individual calling. We are called as a church, but we are also called individually. It's not enough to just sit here and say, I go to church and, and, you know, and that, and, you know, yes, the church supports some missions and that's great. But I mean, you as a person individually are also called to be part of the work. You're, you're, you're part. We all embody this Ruth together. And Ruth is out there and working in the field. And her eyes are on that field. And every single one of us in here tonight, there's a neighbor. There's a friend. There's somebody, my friend, that we need to witness to. There's somebody out there that we need to get the gospel to. There's gospel tracts that we can just leave here and there. There's all kinds of opportunities we can have to get the gospel out. Unfortunately, we neglect those opportunities. Why? Because our eyes are not on the field. Our eyes are on our jobs, our houses, our things. Of this world. We need to get our eyes on the field. You say, but pastor, I got bills and I got the, I understand all that, but I believe if your eyes are on the field and you're working, my friend, and you're working and you're, you're part of this calling to get the gospel out, that God will take care of your physical needs. You know, in the gospel of John chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ met a Samaritan woman. And, 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 and she went out and called all her Samaritan uh, people to, to come see the Lord Jesus Christ. She said, come here a man. And, and, and they didn't have any food. And so the, 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 the disciples, they say to Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, we don't have any meat. And he said, my meat is to do the will of him, of him that sent me and to finish his work. And he said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. On the, uh, they are white already to harvest. And as he said that, those Samaritans were coming towards them saying, look on the field. Look at the harvest. This is what we need to be looking at. This is the work that God has called us to. Every single one of us individually. Number three, I think people have failed to disconnect from home. I'm almost done tonight. Who cares about the Super Bowl? Super Bowl is not going to do anything for anybody. You know, Look at verse 2. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Notice that she had to disconnect. Notice that she had to say, Let me go. All right, go. You know, me and Miss Mary, when we went to Nova Scotia, we went alone. We knew nobody there. We, we didn't know anybody. We didn't know where we were going. But it was like just total. I mean, just following what the Lord w- was guiding us to do. And, and this is what I believe, my friend, for every single one of us tonight. When God is guiding you in a direction, this is the way. Walk ye in it. And God will make His will clear to you as you go. Somebody said to me this when we were there. And we were looking for a house to purchase. Somebody said to me here. And they meant well. They were from our church here in Montreal. They meant really well. But they said to me this, they said, Peter, don't buy a house, just rent an apartment. I said, why? Don't get locked in there. You never know, you might have to leave. And and I know they meant well when they said that, but in my mind, I wasn't thinking I'm going to leave. In my mind, I was thinking, I am here to stay till the rapture. Or till I, that's what was in my mind. It was God that had to convince me to come back. But in my mind, I was going there to stay. I was disconnecting completely. You know anything about Philip? 
God tells Philip this. Arise, Philip. Go to Gaza, which is desert. Philip's in Samaria where there's a revival going on. People are getting saved. And God tells him, the angel of the Lord says, Philip, arise and go to Gaza, which is desert. Now, the, the Lord didn't say, Philip, you're going to go down there. You're going to meet an Ethiopian eunuch. He's going to have a lot of money. He didn't say anything like that. He just said, Philip, he didn't give him that much information. He just said, Philip, arise and go to the desert. The desert, what's in the desert? Who's in the desert? What am I going to drink in the desert? What am I going to eat in the desert? Doesn't matter. God said, go to the desert. Philip got up and went to the desert. And he's in the desert and he sees an Ethiopian eunuch and he's reading the scriptures and the Bible, and the Bible says, the Lord says, go join thyself to this chariot. And he ran and preached to him Jesus. And if that man was the Ethiopian eunuch, and I mean, he was the man that was in charge of uh, Candace's uh, uh, caravan, you know, from, uh, uh, from Ethiopia, I guarantee you that man had some money to give Philip a nice offering. All I'm saying here tonight is this. You don't need to ask all that information. Where am I going to go? What's going to happen? What am I going to do? How am I going to get the money? How am I just, just, you know, God says go. And he just went. And he trusted God by faith. 600 missionaries went to China in the days of Hudson Taylor without any support at all. They just went. They didn't have any support coming in or money. or They didn't know how they were going to get paid. God was calling them to China and they just went. And they said, we're just going to pray and trust God to take care of us. That's faith. That's disconnecting. That's disconnecting. We have failed to disconnect. When God calls us to go, you cannot bring your church with you. You cannot bring your loved ones with you. Ruth left it all behind. God tells Abraham, come out of Ur of the Chaldees. And he says, come out from, from among your kindred. That means your family. You know what Abraham does? He takes a lot with him. And he has a lot of trouble. With a lot. And then when he finally separates from Lot, then Abraham begins to see the land that God called him to. God calls Barnabas and Saul to go into the missionary work. What do they do? They take John Mark with them. Why? He was a family member of Barnabas's. Ends up causing them problems. We cannot bring our family and friends with us. And if our church is to fulfill its calling to the Great Commission, it's not going to just be by the money we send to missions. I'll tell you something else. It will be by the best of our families, our dearest loved ones. We'll have to, we will have to give. And let them go out of our church in order for the world to be saved and for Christ to be obeyed. God is not going to take from our church those who stay home on a Sunday night to watch the Super Bowl. God's going to take the most faithful, the most dedicated, the best givers, the best workers. And we're going to have to let go and say, let God be obeyed. Let Christ be glorified. No greater example for missionary work than the Moravians who were fleeing persecution and finally settled on the estate of Count Zizendorf where they finally had peace, where they settled over there and started their own community and built up a great community of Christian workers and prayed and just raised their families in peace and worshipped God in a great big Christian community owned on the estate of this man, Count Zizendorf. But after a while, they realized we can't just stay here. There's a world out there that needs to be reached. And you know what they did? They began to go to places like the West Indies and reach the slaves. They had to sell themselves into slavery themselves to go reach the slaves because the way it worked over there was that you were not allowed to talk to slaves unless you were a slave yourself. That was the rules. So in order for them to win the slaves, they had to become slaves. And they gave their own lives and can you imagine being a slave? Can you imagine working morning to night? You have a job, praise God. But imagine you work, you work, you work, and the day of the paycheck comes and uh, somebody just takes it. You don't even get the money. You just work. You do the work. Somebody else takes your money. Now, I know we're kind of halfway there with our government. Yeah. <laughs> but thank God we still get some of it. But imagine having it all taken. You get nothing. That's being a slave. And those men were willing to do that because they wanted to reach those souls that were slaves in the West Indies. It doesn't matter what they are on the outside. God wanted those souls to be saved. 
Fourthly and finally here tonight, last thing on the list, I think people have failed to be humble. Just look with me in verse 3. Look at this. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Notice that she just gleaned. She gleaned the ears of corn. Picked up those little pieces that the reapers left behind. The reapers are coming by, man. They're gathering all these great big sheaves. And those little pieces that fall behind, Ruth is walking by and picking them up. And let me tell you something. God wants those little pieces. God wants those little pieces. She comes in after the great reapers. I picked up all the great amounts. And here we are here tonight. And I believe that's us. After the Moody's and the Spurgeons and the, and the Norrises have, have had their churches of five and ten and twenty thousand. And have won their millions to the Lord in the times of harvest. Here we are pastoring little churches of twenty people, twenty-five people. A church of thirty people. A Bible-believing church of thirty people in Canada. You're doing very well. We're just gleaning. But you know what? God wants those little ears of corn. Don't leave them there on the field. Go get them. God wants the gleanings. There was a guy I was talking about this recently. There was a guy from a uh, from Shady Acres Baptist Church. He went out as a missionary to one of the uh, to pastor a church in Texas. And for I don't know, I think it's been like 10, 15 years. He has pastored nothing but two people. That's all he's had. He's had two people. I was talking to Brother Farley about this the other day. It was funny. He said the guy has been pastoring two people for like 15 years. He said, after 15 years, he came to me and he said, Brother Farley, I don't, I, after all these years, all I got is two people. Do you think that maybe God wants somebody else to step in? Maybe I, I can't do it. Brother Farley looked at him and said, Sir, brother, you have the best kids. Your kids are amazing. They love God. They're well behaved. They, they are so zealous about the work of God. He said, yeah, okay, you've got two people. But you, you ever think that maybe God has you out there in his will? And because you're in his will, it's, a, it's blessing your family. And this is what he said to him. He said, maybe God has you out there to keep your kids away from the goofballs we have here in our church. Amen. <laughs> that would be a bad influence on them. You don't know what God's doing. I mean, that's one way to look at it. God will reward, will reward us not for our amounts, not for our numbers, but for our faithfulness. And this is what we need to see here, my friend. The last thing I want to say to you is that she's working on Boaz's field. It's not our field. It's Boaz's field. It's not our world. It's God's world. He said, God so loved the world. It's, it's God's field. It was not Ruth's. It was Boaz's. And here we are, we're just working a field that doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to the Lord. And we need to be faithful at it. And we need to be humble at it. And that means if all we pick up is a few gleanings along the way, it doesn't matter. As long as we've been faithful, God will bless us and reward us on the other side. Let's all stand here tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, and we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, and the opportunity we have to be in your house tonight. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for blessing us, Lord. Dear God, I, I appreciate so much, Lord, uh, just how good you've been, Lord, and you've given increase, and we've worked, and we've sown the seed. And Lord, bless our missionaries, Lord, every single one of them. And Father, I pray that you'd please encourage every single one of them. And Lord, help us now, Father, to remember to call them out before your throne of grace by name and ask you to help them and their families. Bless this church, Lord, and help us, Father, never to lose that vision and never to take our eyes off the field, but to keep our eyes on it always. Lord. Bless all our ministries, radio, Awana, whatever, whatever way, whatever artery, whatever avenue there is of reaching the world, Lord, please. So, Lord, help us, Father, to do it well and to do it faithfully. Thank you for all that you have done. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.